So deception has been with us a long time. 2,500 years ago, in the art of war, Sun Tzu wrote, all warfare is based on deception. Hence, when we are able to attack, we must seem unable. When using our forces, we must appear inactive. When we are near, we must make the enemy believe we are far away. When far away, we must make him believe we are near. Now, let's face it, is a 2,500 year old quote still relevant today? Well, how about something a little bit more modern? In his 2016 book, Practice to Deceive, notice deception expert and author Barton Whaley stated, in combat, deception can strengthen the weaker side. When all other factors are equal, the more deceptive player or team will always win. Hello, I am Kevin Fiscus, and this is the Take Back the Advantage podcast, where we talk about all things deception. Now, our focus is going to be on cyber deception, uh, but anything that plays in that space is, uh, is fair game. And this is episode number one. Now, as we get into this, uh, just setting the stage, we need to understand why deception is a big deal. And there's a couple places we can look to find the answer to that. Uh, in the 2020 M Trends report put out by uh, uh, FireEye, they talk about what's called the median dwell time. Basically, how much time do the bad guys stay on our networks before we catch them? And across all breaches, that number, according to FireEye, is about 56 days. So almost two months, bad guys are on our network. Now, we can also contrast that with another report, the Ponemon Institute Cost of a Data Breach Report. Um, and they talk about the mean time to identify. Now, in 2018, they identified the mean time to identify as 197 days. In 2019, it was 206 days. Um, now, as we look at these numbers, uh, there's obviously a big difference between Mandiant's numbers and the Ponemon numbers, and we could get into a conversation about why that is, but it's really not that relevant, because the fact of the matter is, even having a bad guy on our network for two months is a bit of a problem. Now, this isn't just a problem from uh, sort of a theoretical or a problem in principle. It's a problem in, in fact. Uh, again, according to that uh, Ponemon Institute study, uh, they analyze some of the factors that increase or decrease costs of a data breach. And it turns out that the time it takes to detect and contain a breach has a direct correlation to the cost of the breach. Uh, in fact, if we look at uh, 2019's numbers, if a breach is detected and responded to inside of 200 days, the average cost of that breach is $3.34 million. But if we go outside, if we exceed 200 days, the average cost of that breach jumps up to $4.56 million. It's a 36.5% increase. Um, and if we look back historically over like the last five years, we see the average increase in cost below, between below 200 days and above 200 days is about 33%. So that means that the amount of time that it takes us to directly or the amount of time that it takes us to detect and respond to incidents directly impacts the cost of that data breach. Now that's super important for us in the information security world because information security, the focus of it is to manage risk to a level that is acceptable. And risk could be defined as the likelihood that a threat exploits a vulnerability causing harm. Now, if we look at that sort of equation, we have likelihood, threat, vulnerability, and harm. Now, we can't really do a whole lot about the threats because they happen, you know, in most cases, they operate outside of our control. We have for decades tried to manage vulnerabilities and have been somewhat successful, but the fact is it only takes one vulnerability for the bad guy to get in. And so we've seen over 30 years that trying to exclusively manage or get rid of vulnerabilities is not a winning strategy. What about harm, though? And this gets down to if we can reduce the harm as a result of a data breach, we continue to reduce risk. And based on the results of the Ponemon Institute study, we can reduce harm by detecting and responding faster. So the question then becomes, why don't we do this? And uh, this goes back uh, to that, uh, that uh, Barton Whaley quote that we talked about before, where it talked about in combat deception can strengthen the weaker side when all other factors are equal, the more deceptive player or team will always win. Um, so that quote 
uh, if we look at that, the bad guys, our adversaries have been using deception for decades, right? They evade our antivirus. They evade our application whitelisting. They bypass NAC. They circumvent firewalls. Um, and they do this by making their evil appear not evil, right? They, they use deception and therefore they continue to win. And this is in large part because a lot of our detective strategies focus on looking for indications of evil, which means that what the bad guys need to do is simply change what they do to make it look not evil. They don't need to make it look good. They just need to make it look not evil. So again, we have a bit of a problem there that we've been losing this battle for quite some time. Well, this is where the concept of cyber deception comes into play. So cyber deception, what we're doing is we're placing resources on a, on a network or in, in an environment that have no other business or mission value, uh, which means that nobody should ever be connecting up to those resources. If somebody does connect up to those resources, well, that is suspicious and that is actionable. And that's sort of the fundamental concepts of deception. Now, we can look back. Uh, there was a, a book written in 1979 by a guy named Ken Follett called Triple. Now, this book um, focused on what was called Operation Plumbat, which was a 1968 Mossad operation designed to facilitate the Israeli nuclear power program and nuclear weapons program. They were trying to get yellow cake uranium. But he talks about the techniques that they were using. He says there were dozens of ways of planting telltales. A light hair struck across the crack of a door was the most simple. A scrap of paper jammed against the back of a drawer would fall out when the drawer was opened. A lump of sugar under a thick carpet would be silently crushed by a footstep. A penny behind the lining of a suitcase lid would slide from front to back if the lid were open. So what we're talking about with deception is placing the cyber equivalent of the hairs across the door or the penny in the suitcase lid. Now, as we look at this, let's face it, this is not anything that's entirely new. Uh, we're talking in the context of cyber deception, but deception has been around for a long time. Um, in World War II, it was heavily implemented. Um, one of the things that I, I particularly like, there was a quote by General Sir Archibald Wavell um, in, in the book, or in his, in his paper, uh, Ruses and Stratagems of War. He said, perhaps the most elementary principle of deception is to attract the enemy's attention to what you wish him to see and to distract his attention from which you wish him not not to see. So not only are we planting telltales, the tripwires, the triggers, the traps that allow us to detect the attackers, we're also trying to change their behavior. We're trying to direct them where we want them on our network. And it's this focus on a behavioral change that is so important. Um, Lieutenant Colonel David Strangeways, who was the commander of Deception R-Force uh, dealing with Operation Fortitude, he said the object of any deception plan is not to make the enemy think something but to do something. So as we talk about cyber deception, we're bringing together all of these concepts of changing our adversary's perception of our network to entice behaviors that are desirable to us so that we can distract the enemy, our adversary, the attacker, from what we don't want them to get access to and focus their attention on where we want them to go. And at the same point in time, triggering alerts so that we know where they are, we can watch them, learn from them, or respond to them more effectively. Um, so a little bit of an intro on cyber deception. Um, I wanted to now introduce uh, our guest uh, for our first episode, uh, Tony Cole. So uh, I told him uh, ahead of time, I actually stole his profile from LinkedIn uh, to, to make sure that I got all the cool parts in it. So Tony, uh, again, globally recognized cybersecurity expert, board member, advisor, strategist, and business executive with over 30 years of experience in cybersecurity, risk management, product engineering, HR, marketing, P, uh, profit and loss management, and related operations. He's currently the chief technology officer for Ativo Networks. He's also served on numerous boards and committees focused on cybersecurity and risk management uh, through appointments by the, the president of the United States, the FCC commissioner, NASA administrator, and others. He's um, a member at large of the NASA Advisory Council, and he's on the ISC Squared Board of Directors, co-chairing the audit committee. 
Uh, in 2014, he was awarded Government Computer News Industry IT Executive of the Year. In 2015, he was uh, inducted into the WASH 100 by Executive Mosaic as one of the most influential executives impacting government. In 2018, he was awarded the SC Media Influencer Award for his work as a global strategist and evangelist for cybersecurity issues. Uh, he's also active in a number of charities helping diversification of cybersecurity, STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math training, as well as assisting children in need of medical care uh, via a charity benefiting the Children's National Medical Center. Uh, he's also former president of the ISSA uh, Association or ISSA chapter in uh, Washington, D.C., and has worked uh, in, in the past with uh, organizations like FireEye, McAfee, and Symantec. Um, so I'll throw this out. Uh, Tony, welcome to the program. Uh, I see that it said in 2018 you were awarded an award. You were awarded in, in 2014 and 2015. Um, what happened in 2019, and is there anything that you want to add? No, in fact, uh, I, I did know you're going to read my bio, so uh, always a little embarrassing. So it also shows how old I am. <laughs> <laughs> I do so, know the well, thank, yeah, well, thank you very much for having me on the show, Kevin. Uh, I really enjoyed listening to the opening uh, segment talking about cyber deception. It's not very often I get to do an interview with somebody that's an expert in cyber deception. So to me, that's really cool. And I really appreciate you having me on the show as the, for episode number one. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm so glad you could be here. Um, you know, we've had lots of conversations in the past and, and hopefully this will just continue to be one of those. Um, what I wanted to do, one of the first things that I wanted to do in this episode was I always want to have like a, a news of the week. So pick an article or two uh, that I was able to find that seemed pretty interesting. And I found one that coincidentally, I, I found it, it, it showed up on my news feed a couple of times. The first time it showed up, I'm like, yes, this is what I want to talk about. The second time it showed up, it was a TiVo tweeting the exact same uh, story. <laughs> so uh, I thought that was kind of cool. Uh, this was actually from IT Brief out of Australia. And it talks about six benefits of initiating a deception strategy for IT security teams. And I thought that was a really cool way of kicking off uh, the initial episode of this podcast is to talk about those benefits. Uh, so I'll just jump through a couple of them and you know get your thoughts on them as we go through there. Uh, so the first one that it points out talks about the reduced amount of time taking to detect attacks. Because as soon as a bad guy touches any of our deceptive resources, as soon as they you know try to connect up to a resource or whatever, we generate an alert. Um, the next one that they talk about is basically is similar, but it's tricking attackers into revealing their presence on a network as they move laterally, as they interact with systems, as they use credentials that we've planted there. Uh, we can kind of figure out what's going on, detect them easily that way. Now, that's all great. Um, and we can almost say some of the same things or some of the promises from um, technologies like SIM and IDS and all that kind of stuff that we've had in the past. Let's detect stuff faster. Um, they add a, a third benefit, which I think is really important. Generate only high quality actionable alerts. Um, I think this is super, super important. The very first demonstration of any deception technology that I ever saw, uh, the, the folks that were demonstrating it showed me their dashboard and they basically said, this should be empty all the time unless some bad guy is actually attacking you, which I thought was super, super, super important. So detect faster in different circumstances and then have those detections have very low false positives, very high fidelity attacks. Um, the, the fourth benefit was removing reliance on signature-based security technologies. So in other words, instead of looking for evil, we have now moved towards looking for abnormal. Uh, and I think that's huge. Uh, capture information about the type and nature of an attack of the attack that's taking place. This is also really, really cool because we can now detect the bad guys faster with, and, and do so in ways that generate a lot of actionable threat intelligence, and even attack attribution information. So we can get a lot more information about the bad guys, which allows us to understand their behavior more and, and then adapt and adjust and come up with better security programs. And the last one was, again, along the same lines, deliver a threat intelligence dashboard that gives teams a clear, real-time view of exactly what's going on on the network. 
I think that's a pretty good summary of some of the things you can do from a cyber deception perspective. Um, so I'll throw this out to you, Tony. Do you like it? Are they missing anything? Uh, what do you think? I think they've covered the vast majority of it. And I think that uh, you, you summarized it really, really well. It's such an important piece that, that people don't typically think about. They all look you know, for many, many organizations around the globe to prevent people from coming into their environment. And as you stated you know, early on, so we're not successful in that space. You've got to look for detection inside the environment. So you've got to look for that east-west traffic, you know, people moving laterally, and that's completely missed today. And that's where deception really fits in. The other piece that's very difficult that I want to add was the one about the empty dashboard. That's a big problem for us because for years, vendors and you know, the companies I was at included you know, previously, that's been problematic because they wanna see a dashboard that lights up frequently and deception should not light up frequently. That's why people like it. Gartner says it's simple, inexpensive and works. And we don't know of a higher signal to noise ratio. And that's really important you know, when you think about alert fatigue and all the alerts that people get overwhelmed with from firewalls and IPS and uh, you know, all the different tool sets that are out there. So it's important for people to have an empty dashboard and to know when they see something on there, oh my gosh, I got to react because something's moving through my network that shouldn't be there. Yeah, I, I, the way that I kind of look at it is um, kind of twofold. So I bring up two things. So you're talking about this concept of stopping the bad guys from getting onto our network. And I kind of equate it historically, right? At one point in time, defensive security, uh, the, the pinnacle of defensive security technology was a castle, right? Big walls and, and defensive turrets and all that kind of stuff. We don't use castles anymore today. And we don't use them because we can't build walls that are big and hard and crunchy enough, right? It's always either a way through the wall, under the wall, over the wall, or we just break the wall down. And so while that's kind of a physical security thing, the concepts remain exactly the same from a cyber perspective. Uh, so I think that's super important. And then going to your concept of like that concept of the dashboard being en empty. I, I've not actually seen any kind of metrics around this, but it would be really interesting to see how many man hours, how much, and if you equate that to money and resources and all that, how many man hours are spent sorting through the alerts yeah. that get generated from IDSs and SIMs and all that kind of stuff. We want all this noise and we take a huge amount of security resources and we apply them to just trying to beat the technology into submission and get it to work effectively. And if we could free up those resources and allocate them to more productive tasks, it'd be an amazing thing to do. Well, I think that's huge. Yeah, I agree with you. And it's really interesting. So many conversations take place around, you know, what can you do with deception? You know, and then, and, and I, like I said, I like the way you structured this because we think of it as, as art and science. And the science is deception, the technology put in place, the breadcrumbs, the lures across production, the decoy environments. But the art form is what do you want to do with that? How long do you want the adversary to be able to play inside your decoy environment without them knowing, you know, they're in a decoy environment? Do you want to drop some technology in place where you know you're feeding they do a query on active directory and you're feeding information back to them that's not correct you know so leading them into that decoy environment so that's a lot of the art form you can build on top of it do you want to use your real operating systems modify data so they steal that data you don't care because you're tracking that you've got uh, you know honey documents inside there so so many different pieces you can do with it but all of that can help reduce the noise level because you start to know in your existing security stack, what technologies are working and what aren't. Because if you're tracking that adversary, then you start to see, all right, this endpoint technology didn't do its job. This firewall, this IPS didn't do its job. Here's where it fell down. We can get that fixed or we upgrade the technology or we put something new in place. Yeah, I mean, and that, that, that's, um, that's super huge, this concept of that art versus science. I mean, if you think about it, if we talk deception, we're talking about concepts that are in excess of 2,500 years old, right? Yeah. And in terms of technology, um, and you, know, you may have some different thoughts on this, but my experience with the technology is the technology isn't the obstacle, right? The technology is fairly easy to deploy and easy yeah. to manage and all that. The problem is that this is not a technology 
focused initiative. What we're trying to do is we're focused on the human beings that are on the other side of the, the equation, the attackers that are out there, and trying to create a story for those people. And if that story is inconsistent, if that story doesn't match our adversary's expectations, if that story is not in line with what our adversary is looking to do, it falls flat. You can have the best technology in the world, but if you're not telling the right story, then it's going to get discounted, disbelieved, that kind of thing. But if you can tell the right story, if you can make it consistent, if you can create that pretty picture that you present to the attacker that matches their expectations, that's in line with their goals and objectives, then magic can absolutely happen. But it does require that, that art portion of it, which is super, super important. Yeah, now, it's, a, it's a really... Go ahead. I was just, just going to say it's a really fun area to think about. I, I like to call it home field advantage, you know, so, and it's really the defender taking back home field advantage. They're building upon their field that they have, they own. And most defenders today don't think about it. They're back on their heels, getting pushed back all the time. But you start to build out that art form, the campaigns is what we call them, mm -hmm. you know, specific to what you're trying to defend, you know, and you suddenly are starting to build a distinct advantage, you know, for your own enterprise that you didn't have in the past. Because you can go through, it's your home field and design, you know, based on the knowledge of your own network, you know, what you want that adversary to see, where you want them to go, and what you want to learn about them. So there's a tremendous amount you can do in that space. And it's really difficult sometimes for, for defenders that are using preventative technologies to wrap their heads around these, these you know, 2,500-year-old 2, 2, concepts. And I mean, if you think about it, in some respects, deception is almost the antithesis of everything else we do in computer in, in the computer world, right? In computer world, everything's binary, right? It's a one or a zero. We have A or we have B, and it's very, very easy to kind of, if you are in that space, you start to just get this mindset of, well, it's going to do this, A, A plus B always equals C. Uh, deception is more or less a mind game, right? It, it's getting away from the ones and zeros and getting to a much more analog, how do people think and how do people actually um, you know, do what they do, right? It's, it's a fascinating thing, but it is a difficult thing for some people who have lived their life in IT to move into this and go, wait a minute, this is very creative, right? This is not a plus B equals C, this is, we're painting a picture, which is really awesome stuff. Yeah. So let me ask you this. Um, one of the things that I often get when I talk to people about deception is basically, hey, look, what, what you're saying, we've been doing this for, for 20, 30 years. You, uh, this is just honeypots, right? So why should we pay attention to honeypots? They never really did anything great in the past. What makes you think they're going to do something different now? So how is deception different from what we used to do uh, with honeypots? Yeah, so I'll tell you, when, uh, when the HoneyNet project first started, Lance Spitzner started rolling with this. I was in, still in the military. I was running network security on the Pentagon backbone. And it was very interesting to me when I read his first paper, Know Your Enemy. Mm -hmm. So when I reached out to Lance and uh, you know, became good friends with him and did a lot of work with the uh, HoneyNet project, brought some of the founders into the Pentagon and had a number of different discussions and bought technology. And at that point in time, honeypots were very, very difficult to put in place because we were fighting with lawyers all the time. Because <laughs> honeypots were all, you know, thought about for research. You know, you take an unpatched system, you put it on the internet, so an adversary compromises it, and you look to see how they compromise the system. The adversary knows very, very quickly they were inside a honeypot. Today, honeypots have not advanced that much. So honey nets have advanced a little, but still not a lot, just more virtualized solutions than they were. Back then in the late 90s and early 2000s, it was difficult because you needed to actually build from a bare metal system, you needed operating system expertise, application expertise, so in whatever data you wanted to put in there, as well as recovery and analysis expertise. So it was not easy to do. And even today, you still need a lot of that same expertise, but in a virtualized environment. And the deceptive solutions available today, so are totally different. You can lay uh, breadcrumbs, lures, config files, all deceptive across your production environment. And for instance, uh, 
Joe Snuffy comes into work, logs in one morning. So, and the first thing he sees on his system is an email from his CEO that looks super real, super important. And they immediately, you know, goes in and opens this Excel spreadsheet and bam, compromised, right? So, well, what's interesting is the first thing the adversary does, we all know they'll go in and they'll typically scrape memory. They'll look, they'll find some deceptive credentials. They don't know they're deceptive. So, and immediately they go and they do a query on Active Directory. What they don't know is the Active Directory they went to was in the decoy environment, and now they're inside a decoy environment playing in that space and have no clue they're doing that. And you're collecting data on them and getting alerts from them immediately. That's the massive change today is you can put this as a complete fabric across the premise, on-premise, in a hybrid environment, partially cloud, partially on-premise, or even in the cloud, deceptive uh, S3 buckets, deceptive Lambda functions, doesn't matter. You can make a deceptive fabric across everything. Cyber physical systems, we do that with Department of Energy, so working on some new stuff for them. That's public, by the way. Uh, lots and lots of stuff that you can do in this space, totally different than the simple honeypot that researchers typically use to see if somebody actually went into that environment. Instead, you can take those real operating systems and put them into the decoys, modify the data if you wish. Mm -hmm. So if you do battery formulas, maybe you modify a formula and then drop those, data, uh, those documents in there, make them decoy docs so you can follow it back to see where the adversary is coming from. So many different things that you can do today that's totally different from just the initial honeypots and honey nets. Yeah, I think for me, one of the differences boils down to when we used to have honey pots and honey nets, it was basically, um, it, it was a roach motel, right? It was, it yeah. was stick it somewhere. Good analogy. And, you know, and it, so it was kind of a cross between a roach motel and a hacker zoo, right? It was yeah. stick something somewhere, hope that the roaches come to it maybe bait it a little bit, but we're basically just creating a fake environment that we just hope the attackers are going to go interact with so we can watch what they do, thus the hacker zoo portion. Um, the big difference that I see with deception is that instead of just sort of putting a roach motel out there, what we're doing is understanding the behavior of the roaches. We are specifically planting those roach motels exactly where we know those roaches are going to go. So it's not just a generic hope somebody comes here, but we're taking our understanding of the adversary's behavior and we're using that against them, which I think is a really cool thing. Really cool thing. Well, and yeah. Kevin, before, before we move on, one yeah. other piece I wanted to point out, when you layer the campaign piece on top of, of deceptive platforms today in comparison to honeypots, that's another dramatic change you know, that provides great capabilities. Because today, you know, when you build out that campaign, you're studying as, you know, the roaches was a great analogy. You're studying where they're coming from, how they got in, what they're doing, and you're leading them. You know, you're making those roaches take an action. And that's, that's critically important. As you talked about physical deception in the past, you know, it's critically important to have them take an action that's not going to be uh, disruptive to your production environment. Instead, now you're starting to study them and starting to understand, you know, what they're doing, where they're going, what they're after. Yep. You know, and then you can play as much as you want in that where you're studying the adversary or even some customers on deception will just use it for a detection environment. They've mm -hmm. discovered it, how they get in, pop them out, close that hole and move on to the next one. Yeah, I think it kind of goes to the completeness of the picture. I mean, with deception, you can go to the point of creating a fake Facebook profile that talks about fake users that are deploying fake technology, and you put that stuff out there so that the attacker who happens to uh, discover that during their reconnaissance is now expecting that technology to be there. So when they see it, they don't, they're not suspicious in any way, shape or form. So that, that campaign, that, that, that creating that deceptive cover story is I think a huge differentiator between those. And dynamic as well. And oh that's yeah. The last piece that's super important that you can update it, change it. So an adversary finds it, you bounce them out, then you go in and you can change the max, the IPs, the campaigns, they come back again and they're like, you yeah, know, so, they don't so know what's about, real, what isn't. Yeah, think about it like this. So we talked about all of the time that's spent or perhaps wasted um, tweaking and tuning IDSs. How much more fun is it going to be to wake every up every day and actively manipulate attackers than sorting through a million IDS alerts? Right. It, yeah. I mean, not only is it more effective, but to me, it sounds like a whole lot more fun, also. Absolutely. Yeah, it absolutely is. 
So let me ask you this. What do you see? So I, when I talk, again, talking to people about deception, I get this kind of pushback and it's a really weird pushback. And it basically goes to, hey, this sounds really cool, but if it's as good as you say it is, why A, isn't everybody doing it right now? And why haven't we been doing it for the last 30 years if the technology's been around there? So uh, I'll kind of spin that around to either responding specifically to that or what do you see are the major obstacles to more universal deployment of deception technologies? Yeah, there's a number of pieces in there. You know, one, you have the, uh, the vendor FUD that's continuously fed. Oh, you don't want to buy that. You know, we can do that too. You know, uh, we can prevent the attacks and, you know, it's unfortunate how many times you look online and you see a vendor claiming 100% security. So deception isn't perfect either. There's no silver bullet. I mean, anybody who's, you know, uh, been around this industry for a while knows there is no perfect solution. And I think that's a critically important point is when you are targeted by a well-resourced adversary, nation state, or even organized crime today. So over a given period of time, sooner or later, they're going to get into your environment. So it's important to have something that's looking east-west that actually allows you to disrupt, you know, their their uh, their goals. Mm -hmm. So inside your environment. So when you look at deception, you know, I think we've had a lot of issues because the technology really in the last four years has accelerated mm -hmm. when it's incorporated so many of the other pieces in there. Uh, for the older people that listen to this podcast, I like to liken us to uh, to the old BASF commercials, you know, on how we make technologies better. Yeah. So we do, yeah, we do integration with 30 different, you know, uh, uh, large cybersecurity providers today. So we feed that intelligence into existing threat intelligence platforms. We feed into orchestration systems. Uh, we actually feed into EDR systems and uh, uh, router and firewall and IPS. So you can go through and you can quarantine, you know, using technology. So feeding into the processes that already exist. The alerts are separate and distinct. You know, you can feed, them, feed those into your SIM as well. But the important point you said is, you know, these are real alerts. But it's been the last four years of technology that's accelerated so fast, which is why, you know, Gartner has talked about deception for the last two years. And now NIST has put it in, you know, three new draft, you know, uh, uh, mm -hmm. guidelines. And it's going into the cybersecurity framework as well. So because it's had such success, even though people do not talk about it. And that's a big piece. We've got Fortune 50 customers that rolled out globally. People don't talk about deception, which is silly because you can change up the campaigns yeah. and uh, in that dynamic environment, but still people don't like to talk about this technology because they're afraid for some reason that an adversary is going to know you're running deception and maybe be more careful walking through your environment. doesn't yeah. matter, though, because it's dynamic. Yeah, and I would say I, I, I think that that is a legitimate concern, sort of, right? It's one of those things where – at least today, we have a lot of advantages when deploying deception. And one of the biggest is that the, the adversaries, the attackers aren't expecting it. Now, to your point, there's no reason you can't modify, change the campaigns, change the time. I mean, there's all kinds of flexibility, but I do see how uh, organizations that aren't really familiar with it may want to keep it under the belt because they're not ready to have that much of an active involvement in their deception uh, program. Because if you think about most security technologies, it's deploy the technology manage and patch and update the technology, but it's not interactive. You're not on the fly modifying your firewall yeah. rules. So it's a, just a different behavior, but I, I think that that's a, 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 huge, a huge point. Uh, let me ask you this. What would you say to, so if somebody came up to you and said, hey, I love this cyber deception stuff. This stuff is the best thing that I've ever seen. Um, I, I, I need to go talk to my boss about it. How do I, how do I talk to my boss and get them to what, what they may perceive as take a risk in, in this whole new technology area. How do I convince my boss to give this a shot? Well, there's a, a lot of good documentation that can help people understand the value. So, and, and we provide a lot of that information as well, but some of the semi-independent, you know, for instance, EMA, Enterprise Management Associates, went out and did a survey of deception users. And quite frankly, this is paid for by all the deception vendors, but it was mm -hmm. independent. You know, they went out and did it on our behalf. And they found there was a 91% reduction rate in dwell time by using deception. Because again, people start to very quickly trust it and realize these are high fidelity alerts. 
yeah, Nick may blow up or you may forget to whitelist one of your own internal red team tools. So, so there are, you know, not, like I said, nothing's perfect, but nevertheless, as you walk through this thing, when you see an alert, it's actionable. You need mm -hmm. to take action. Something's going on. It doesn't get lost in that haystack of false positives coming out of IPS and from endpoints. And some of the other pieces that are really interesting is, you know, NIST is now, by the end of this year, according to Gartner, supposed to be the cybersecurity framework is going to be utilized by 50% of large enterprises in North America, mm -hmm. 50%. Well, it's going into the cybersecurity framework. It's in yeah. 853 Rev 5, it's in 871 b for high value assets. So, so if you've got sensitive information on high value assets, NIST is recommending you run deception. So there are lots and lots of pieces to tell people why this is important. And the last piece I will tell them that makes it easier to deploy this, that's super important, is it has almost no impact on the production environment mm -hmm. because the decoys are running in unused IP space. Very easy to deploy. Machine learning listens to your environment. All right, here's the recommended operating systems and applications that get deployed in your unused IP space. It won't have any impact on the production side. The only impact are the breadcrumbs and lures that are very easy to drop using your existing technology on how mm -hmm. you do updates to those systems. So, so very little impact and high fidelity alerts independently validated would be my point. Yeah, and one of, one of the ways that I kind of look at it is, and, and we're actually going to, I'm going to do a, a little demo demonstration of this at the end of this, uh, at this session, but um, even something like uh, many people are familiar with the, the, the tool Netcat, right? It's just a little listener that can pop up there. And what I tell people is, again, do this with permission or whatever, but just simply popping up a simple Netcat listener on a laptop that's uh, listening on port 80, right? Nobody should be connecting up to my laptop yeah. on port 80. If anybody does, that's actionable, right? And that's sort of the basics. I mean, it's not very complicated. It's not very sophisticated, but heck, imagine that you're the person in your organization that just decided, again, with permission, whatever, to put a Netcat listener up and you caught the attacker the day after they get on, on the system, right? Just because you saw an alert and you're like, ooh, why did this IP address connect up to me? I mean, that's an amazingly powerful thing. And I don't know of very many other technologies where you can use an incredible concepts, I should say, where you can use an incredibly simple tool that can have that much power, which is, which is just amazing. Yeah, if I could add to that, that's a great point you bring up. You know, that people don't think about it from this perspective, but when you look at what deception does, because people say, well, what about insider threats? Like deception doesn't care. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter if it's an adversary that's crossed the wire, moving east, west, or trying to query Active Directory, you're going to catch them. It doesn't matter if it's an insider threat. When you lay out this system, many organizations roll it out in complete secrecy, and it also integrates with your existing tool sets. So for instance, here's an insider who knows the real Active Directory. They're popping onto different systems where there are different trusted relationships. They're stealing credentials. Guess mm -hmm. what? If they run across an Active Directory creden or credential that's deceptive and they try to use it on the real one, if you've got it integrated, you're still going to get a high fidelity alert, all hands on deck, somebody's using a deceptive credential internally in the real active directory system. So the point is you can catch insiders, uh, adversaries breaking it, and also you can uh, start to understand related to your case with Netcat, you know, you can also understand when people are moving around internally where you do not have security controls, but yet they're violating policies or looking at shares they're not supposed to. They'll run across deceptive shares. They'll run across, uh, you know, shares on other systems, mm -hmm. uh, trusted relationships, things they shouldn't, shouldn't be looking at. And suddenly you've got a means now to detect all of that. Yeah, and that's the kind of cool thing with deception as is even with the insider threat, right? I can plant effectively the breadcrumbs that I want that w if there's an insider and they're doing something, I mean, if the insider is trying to do something and they're exclusively and only accessing resources that they are legitimately allowed to access, that's a really hard threat to stop. Yeah. But most insiders aren't going to limit themselves. They're going to try to exceed what they can do. So they're going to try to find more more stuff. And as they find more stuff, if we can plant these breadcrumbs, we can actually direct the insiders just as easily as we can direct the external yeah. attackers. Um, and I kind of look at it like this, you know, you talk about planting these traps and insiders uh, being a, a particularly nasty threat because they have knowledge of what's going on. And you had kind of talked about, well, if the insider happens to grab a deceptive credential, we've got them. 
And that's kind of a really important piece because it kind of points out that, you know, when we look at defensive security, there's a common statement that's made, you know, defenders need to be right 100% of the time, attackers need to be yeah. right once. And I guess from a purely factual perspective, that's not really correct, right? Because that assumes that one exploit, one vulnerability, and the entire network is compromised. So the way I like to change it is to say an error on the part of an attacker has little impact on that attacker, but an error on the part of a defender has a much more significant impact. But if we look at deception as we're planting all these traps, these telltale, these alerts, whatever, um, the bad guys don't need to interact with all of them. The bad guys can avoid most of them, but as long as they interact with one resource, we catch them. So we literally flip the script and say, once the bad guys get on our network, which let's face it, they're going to. It's a, it's a, a four decades old established fact that the bad guys are gonna get on our network at some point in time. When they do, they have to avoid 100% of our deceptive uh, you know, resources and we only need them to touch one. So we create that defenders need to be right once, attackers need to be right 100% of the time. And that is something we've never been able to say before in the world of information security, which is monumental. Hey, Kevin, on that note, uh, really interesting. You know, We had a customer that shared with us that, that told us on their deceptive deployment, one of the people that helped deploy the technology was fired a couple months later mm. for violating security policies where there were not existing security controls. He helped roll out the deceptive platform and knew where all the deceptive pieces were and still was caught by it and fired. Yeah. So very, very interesting. We had another organization, 22 people walked out you know, uh, over a year period for doing things they weren't supposed to be doing where there were existing uh, existing policies, you know, and they were violating those policies. Yeah. So yeah. it's really, really fascinating that the changes you can make inside your system. We have a few other customers that have rolled it out and said, Hey, big brother's watching on the corporate network. Don't do bad things. That's not very often. Most of them roll it out in secrecy, but occasionally you have those that do the announcement. They work with HR and tell people don't do bad things. We're watching what you do. Yeah. And going to this point of people being aware that deception is there, um, my philosophy is I would rather the attacker not know that I'm using deception, but if they do know that I'm using deception, it's going to change their behavior. Well, it might change it. So if an attacker learns or discovers that I'm deploying deception, then the attacker is going to do one of a few things. One is they're going to leave, right? They're like, I'm out of here. This is too scary. I'm gone. We've provided a deterrence. That's awesome. Yep. Uh, another thing that they can do is, um, they can just continue on as they always have been. And in which case the deception still catches them and life is good. The worst case scenario is that the attacker, um, you know, drops off, changes their IP address and changes their tactics, uh, changes what they're doing. They start looking at more situational awareness information. They start stepping through the network very, very carefully. They start basically baby stepping through the network. And even if they do that, we still win because we've now slowed the attacker down. And if it does take us a little bit longer to catch them, they've been able to do less in that time. So it's a win, win, win across the board, no matter how you do it, which is pretty awesome stuff. Yeah, I agree. So let me throw this out there. Um, all right, I'm sold. I want to go deploy deception. Now, my experience is that, again, deploying the technology isn't really the challenge what have you found are the biggest challenges that organizations face when they decide to and then go to implement deception? What are the, what are the things that are like, oh, I wish I would have thought of this before? Yeah, there's so many different cases in that. You know, yeah. uh, we, we have some of the, uh, the largest financial customers for us have gone through and deployed deception specifically for traveling executives going mm -hmm. to China and Russia where they thought, uh, you know, there's, there's potentially, you know, these are executives at their corporation, probably, you know, high, high, high value targets to yeah. organize crime into nation states. And they built, you know, decoys for these systems, you know, uh, as, as well as the, the uh, breadcrumbs and lures on those systems. 
It was really interesting to see some of them once they've laid that out. So have realized that they didn't do enough on the back end to where they would go. And they've quickly, you know, shifted and, and dropped stuff in data centers now. Now they've rolled out to the data centers before they did, you know, uh, the less high value, I don't want to say less important people, because yeah. certainly not, but, you know, <laughs> less important assets to them, you know, that, that yeah. others are utilizing the organization. So instead, they've changed their whole plan. So my point is that what we recommend always so people don't have these problems is we help them build a crawl, walk, run structure for deception so that if they're a large enterprise, you know, then they can build a structure to lay this out across the board in the most reasonable manner around their high value assets and then start working it out into the other components that are also important to the organization, but would not be crippling if those systems were, you know, compromised and destroyed or the data released in them. So it's, it's really, it's, it's a number of different things, but uh, I think building uh, a really good structure for how you're going to deploy it is easy to do today, as long as you're working with an experienced organization that's done this a lot. Yeah, and I think that for me, the things that I talk to people about when talking about deception is there are just some fundamental, almost like security hygiene things that are going to benefit a deception program. Not required, but yeah. like having a good data asset inventory having a decent data classification solution so you know what your high value assets are in terms of computer stuff and you know where they are. And a lot of organizations just don't know that. So it becomes harder for them to kind of figure out how they want to design that, that story, how they want to create that campaign. Uh, and then the flip side of it is, I think that a lot of organizations have become so comfortable with spending all their time trying to weed through alerts, but they don't necessarily have effective incident response. And what oh, it boils yeah. down yeah. to is, if you're going to deploy deception and it goes off, you had better be ready to respond to that effectively right away. Otherwise, you are losing out in a tremendous amount of the value that deception brings. So having that you know, basic things, data classification, data inventory, know what nodes are on your, know what normal looks like on your network in general terms, what operating systems are there, um, you know, that kind of stuff. And what, you know, what services you're pushing out there. So knowing normal, understanding where your critical assets are, having like a data classification program where you can differentiate between high value and low value or uh, high impact and low impact targets. Uh, and then having a, a defined incident response plan uh, are some of the things that I've seen that people just don't think about, right? Let's go deploy this technology. Yeah. Because let's face it, if you go deploy a SIM and you, or you go deploy an IDS, the day after you deploy it, you're not responding to incidents. You're tweaking and tuning. So everybody expects that you're going to put this in and there's going to be this long ramp up period where you're beating the technology into submission. And that's not the case. It goes in, I mean, just about any size of organization can benefit from it. And when you turn it on, it works. Now, there are nuances to it, right? You can make your story be better. You can make your campaign be better or worse. The good news is today, we are at a tremendous advantage because the attackers don't expect it. So a really bad campaign is still going to work. And as yeah, the attack, that's true. Yeah. As the attackers become more sophisticated, we already have an understanding of how sophisticated our campaigns can be. So we don't need to be there today, but we can be there today. And that's huge, I think. Yeah. And you, you remind me of a really good, uh, important point, you know, for lessons learned. And that's, you know, when you install this, exactly as you said, turn it on, look at the pane of glass, look at the alerts on this. And based on, you know, a couple of weeks, you can start to really build your plan out for what do you want to do your integrations with first. You've yeah. got your existing processes inside your organization. You've got this new technology. So do you want to do the integration first with your EDR component and EPP component, your SIM? You know, how do you want to actually stack that out? Some people build that out ahead of time and really don't have a good grasp of what the process flows are for their security operations center and their incident response team. And yep. this can actually help looking at the alerts that you're getting. All right, here's what we need to do because here's how the adversary is getting in. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so that was sort of the, the, uh, the questions that I have. Anything that you want to just throw in there? Um, last thoughts in terms of this before we jump into a little bit of a, um, a technical segment. Yeah, I just want people to really understand that, uh, you know, it's technology that you should you should try. 
it's uh, we've never seen technology like this in, in all the years I've been in the field and it's been a long time, you know, where CISOs don't talk about this, you know, they don't. So it's, it's not well known that it's doing so well. You know, there are tons of Fortune 500 customers that have rolled this out. Many of them rolled it out globally. You know, it's, it's having a significant impact for them. So the point is, give it a shot, try it. There's a reason Gartner's recommending it. NIST is putting it in guidelines. And uh, if you're familiar with MITER, you know, in the MITRE mm -hmm. attack framework, well, MITRE actually did a, a, a white paper just two months ago, very interesting, and told the defense industrial base and uh, the Department of Defense that uh, you need to be running deception. So laid it out on a white paper to them and stuck it online. So there's a lot of reasons to try this thing. You know, I'll, I'll quote Gartner for my last comment on that. It's simple, inexpensive, and it works. Yeah, I mean, and, and I, the way that I, I kind of look at it when you think about it, um, when I first got involved in deception, right? When I first started kind of learning about it and all that, it took, I spent probably more than six months trying to figure out what I was missing in the context of it can't be this good and it can't be this easy, right? I mean, it's, it's too good and too easy. What am I missing? And it took me over six months to kind of like let it all gel going, I'm not missing anything. Um, I, I, I kind of, and I tell people, and, and I don't think this is a lot of hyper, hyperbole. I believe that when we get to the point where deception is more universally uh, deployed, the entire industry that we work in, the information security industry, will have been fundamentally changed. It will become easier to break into a facility physically to get access to sensitive data than to try to do it across the wire. I think that's the that's what we're talking about with this stuff. This isn't this isn't, you know, evolution. This is revolution if you will. This has the potential of changing the industry that we are in permanently creating a situation where the attackers no longer have the advantage. Thus the take back the advantage podcast. So really yeah. awesome stuff. Well, thanks, Kevin. And I will say, I, I really agree with you. I think uh, in the near future, deception will be the foundation for detection for every enterprise. Absolutely. I, I, I agree as well. Awesome. So, Tony, this has been really awesome. I'm going to do a little bit of a technical segment. Um, if you want to hang out and comment on it, you're more than happy to do so. Uh, but if you got to get going, I completely understand. So, uh, entirely up to you. All right. I'll say. I'll awesome. say. Awesome. So we're going to go ahead and try this. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and do a little bit of uh, screen sharing. So we'll see how this plays out. Uh, let me pop over to, I got to get my, uh, my virtual machine. So basically what I'm doing is um, I'm using Kali Linux. Um, so, and again, it's not, and there's nothing that I'm doing here that is specific to Kali Linux. Uh, in fact, it's, it's literally just, um, I just wanted a Linux platform and that's the one that I happen to do. So what we're gonna do is play around a little bit with, uh, I mentioned that example of using Netcat as a deception solution. So what I wanted to do is kind of show you how that might all work. So if we run just a very simple Netcat listener, uh, so what we're saying is netcat listen dash L on dash P port 80, okay? So what we're doing is we're setting up a Netcat listener. Now let's walk, let's, let's try a couple of things. I'm gonna use Nmap uh, to just do a very basic scan um, against my own local host, okay? Now, what you're gonna see is, all right, I see that port 80 is open and notice nothing happened on my Netcat listener. The reason why no nothing happened is because I'm running netcat as root and the default, or sorry, running nmap as root. And the default behavior for that is to do what's called a syn scan. So we're creating a half open connection, syn, synac, and then a reset. So because we never complete that connection, um, the nothing actually happens from a netcat perspective. Now there's good news and bad news. If you're trying to detect those half open scans, well, that might be, uh, you're not gonna do it in this particular way. But if you're not really worried about the scans, but you wanna know when somebody actually attempts to connect, uh, we can definitely do that. So if I change my nmap command a little bit and I do a dash lowercase s capital T, I'm doing what's called a connect scan. So that's gonna be syn, synac, ACK and then a reset gets sent. Now, when we run that, notice I still see that port 80 is open, and, but on, on the Netcat side, Netcat has shut down. 
right? Because Netcat in this configuration is going to listen for one connection and one connection only. And when that connection terminates, Netcat terminates. Now we've got a little bit of a problem. Great, somebody connected, but we don't really know anything. We just know that a connection happened because Netcat happened to shut down. So what we can do is we can uh, change the behavior of Netcat a little bit. So we're gonna add a dash V in there to be more verbose. So notice now we get a listening on, in this case, port 80. If I go back and I run my Nmap scan again, I got a connect to localhost from, in this case, it happens to be localhost because it's on my same computer, but you actually get the IP address of the host that just tried to connect up to you. Ding, 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 we now have an alert. Now, that's great, and, and, and we can do that. Um, the big problem, though, with uh, this kind of alert is you've got to be staring at your computer to be able to see what's actually going on there. And that, that is a little bit uh, challenging, right? We don't want to just sit there and stare at the computer. Uh, the other challenge that we had is Netcat shut down immediately afterwards, right? So there's a couple of things that we can do in terms of this whole shutdown thing. And one of the examples, see if I can paste this in here properly, is we can just put netcat in a little bit of a while loop, okay? So we're just saying while one, which is an always true statement. And then we're gonna just uh, echo started just to have a visual representation of something's going on. And then we're gonna run our netcat listener on port 80 in ver verbose mode. So we pop that up and it now says listening on port 80. So we jump up and we run our same scan. Notice we got a connection, but then we're also listening on port 80 again. If we ran a scan again, we get another connection. Um, so we can keep it up and running. Now there are ways to do this outside of a while loop. Uh, for example, on Windows, you can run Netcat with a dash capital L. Um, some Linux variants of Netcat have a similar type of thing, but we can keep that persistent listener up and running um, with no problem whatsoever. Um, that said, we do have a little bit of a problem with this particular scenario, because if I go over here and I try to hit control C to kill it, Netcat starts back up again. Control C, Netcat starts back up again. So in this particular scenario, one of the easier ways I could do this in a different way, I'm just gonna kill the terminal window because um, that, an easy way to do that. Now, that said, we also, you know, we can take this a little bit further as well. So I'm gonna show you a couple of other things. So the first thing that we're gonna do is I created a little shell script. So I'm gonna cat this shell script, um, netcat reporter, ncreporter.sh. And we look at it, all I have is a little shell script. Now, as I go through this shell script, what I'm doing with this uh, is I'm trying to overcome one of the weaknesses that we just talked about. Having that netcat, you have to like look at the terminal window. Well, with this little shell script, what we're using is this exec command, which is basically helping us modify input and output. And so we're basically taking the results of this script and using the logger function, we are sending it to syslog with the name associated with the, uh, of this program uh, as a tag for that syslog stuff. So effectively, if we go and we were to run this command, uh, ncreporter.sh, okay? So now we're listening on port 80. So if I do my scan again, right? We go up and we see awesome, uh, we, see, we see some stuff happen. We see a connection that starts back up again and all that stuff. So I'm gonna hit control, whoopsie, not there. I'm gonna hit control C over here and we can kill this because it's actually a shell script. It's so the why we're actually killing the overall shell script. But if I go and I do something like tail var log, messages, we can actually see down here that we see that it started up, it's listening, we saw a connection, so on and so forth. So you're actually getting the data that is associated with that. So that's a really cool way of basically sending these alerts to syslog. So now you can send them to a sim if you wanted to or anything along those lines, which is a really, really, really cool capability. Now, yeah, but, yeah. yeah, yeah. I just wanted to tell you really cool. Unfortunately, I do have to drop now. And I really appreciate you having me on the show. So love uh, thank what you so much, Tony. I appreciate it. And uh, uh, thank you. It's been awesome. I really, really enjoyed it. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. I'm gonna keep on cranking with my uh, with the demo here. But I appreciate you taking the time, and uh, I re really do appreciate it. It's been it's been awesome. Thank you. I look forward to coming back and seeing the rest of the demo later once this is up on the air. You got it. Absolutely. All right. Thanks. All right. Take care.
All right. So, so far what we've got is the ability to uh, generate some alerts, which is pretty cool stuff. Uh, but there's other things we can do with this. So I'll show you another one uh, that I have, which is uh, NC, I, I call this one ncKiller.sh. So this is a little bit weird. Let me, let me just clear this out uh, just so we can see it a little bit more clearly. So ncKiller.sh, this is a little bit of a more complicated structure. So let me show you what's going on here. So we have another while loop. And in this while loop, we're going to generate a date, echo started, uh, the same kind of stuff. But what we're doing here is do, it says IP equals. And then everything that happens in between these parentheses that run from uh, right after IP equals dollar sign and go all the way up to where it says dash F1 and then the close parentheses, the results of that command are going to get put in a variable called IP. So... Um, with this one, we're going to run a netcat listener, be verbose, listen on port 80. Uh, this two is greater than uh, dollar sign one, and uh, one is greater than dev null. What we're basically doing is we're taking the output of this command and throwing it away. I don't really care about the actual output and the it's spit out from this command. Um, what we are concerned with is the stuff that's come that is generated by netcat the actual netcat status messages so we're going to take and look at that netcat status message and we're grepping for the word from which is what's going to show up when we see that connection from such and such an ip address then we're going to use the cut command using an open bracket as a open square bracket as a delimiter and we're going to pull out the the, the third field and then take that and use the cut command to pull out the first field. So effectively what we're doing in all this is extracting just the IP address. Then when all that's done, we're using the IP tables command to generate um, uh, a, a firewall rule using the IP address. So what's effectively gonna happen here is when I run this, if I go here, oops, let me do it this way. Um, NC dash killer. So when I run this guy, okay, it's up, it's listening, it's doing what's going to do. If I go here, uh, let me just uh, clear this out, and I run another uh, 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 nmap scan. If I go do this, notice I don't get a a result quickly. Uh, I do get this started, and it has restarted at that point in time. But but something else has happened. So I'm going to go ahead and kill this, and I'm going to uh, take a look at the, my IP tables. Um, my IP tables uh, rules. And notice we now have a drop rule for my IP address. So any subsequent communications, um, I'm no longer going to be able to get connected. So in this particular use case, you might put this on a critical system, something that contains a lot of super sensitive information. So that if somebody does interact with that critical system in the wrong way, you can now block that IP address. Now, again, we're gonna, just gonna do IP tables, uh, dash F to flush that out and get rid of that. So we can now continue to interact with all that kind of stuff. All right. So next thing I'm going to do, let's go ahead and kill this one. I've got one more uh, option. I'm going to kind of try this one out, but I'm going to show you it first and then I'll show you what the, uh, uh, show you how it works first and then I'll show you the, the code for it. So this is going to be, I just called this NC advanced uh, So, um, and actually it looks like I have some kind of problem. Okay, go ahead. So we got this thing going, life is good. Um, so it started. So let's go ahead and see what happens if I go run my scan again. So when I run my scan again, notice it says down here, it says uh, localhost will not be blocked. Well, that's kind of an interesting behavior. Uh, so the next thing that I'm gonna do is I'm going to jump up and I'm going to put, I'm gonna use a different computer. So this is actually my local computer. I'm gonna do an nmap dash st. Uh, oops, I need to check the uh, uh, IP address. Uh, okay, so 12168.0.194, okay. So we're going to go back over to here, st. 192.168.0. Dot, uh, what was it? 194? I gotta move it over. Okay, 194. Okay, so in this case, I'm gonna do a scan with this guy. And notice this thing is cranking along, it's doing what it's it's doing, but but we're not getting any um and actually it's oddly enough, not okay. There we go. So we we're not getting any results back, and over here it said 
suspicious connection from 192.168.0.140, which is the IP address of my Windows computer that went and did that. Uh, so then it says future connections from this IP address will be blocked. So let's go ahead and look at what we actually did with that little shell script. So we're gonna do cat nc dash advanced. Um, and so what we're doing here is kind of the same thing. We're taking uh, that logger function. So we're writing output to uh, syslog. We have a while loop that we're firing up a netcat listener that's actually doing that same type of analysis uh, as the, the NC killer that we just talked about before. But what it's doing is it's looking at the IP address and it's basically saying if the IP address uh, of the remote thing, if it starts off with 127.0.0, I just use that as an example, then the connections won't be blocked. So you could take a, 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 something like this and identifies exclusion rules and things like that. So there's all kinds of really cool things you can do from a netcat perspective. Uh, if we were to go and do a tail um, var log messages. Uh, and again, we'll see nc advanced.sh. We see some of the, the alert stuff that's generated from there. So these are just different ways that we can go ahead and doing, uh, we can go ahead and do uh, very simple deception technologies, just using things like netcat, right? Uh, a netcat Linux box, uh, it could be as simple as that. Um, so that, uh, I guess, brings us to the end of our discussion uh, for today. Uh, hopefully, you guys have all enjoyed this podcast. Again, episode number one. So um, look forward to more episodes coming up. Um, we've got some other folks that are, are scheduled for uh, interviews and all that kind of fun stuff. Um, so again, thank you so much. Um, do me a favor. Um, if you're kind of looking at this on, on YouTube or whatever, uh, smash that like button. Please share it to as much people as possible. I'd really appreciate anything that you can do to get, to get some um, distribution out for this because uh, I really like to get this message to get out. And I really want to get as many people involved in this deception concept as possible. So uh, once again, take care. Have yourselves a fantastic day. And and uh, we're hoping to roll these things out every week. So uh, look forward next week to another session uh, that we'll have coming up. So take care and remember, take back the advantage.